and we're off and rolling. Hello, it's a new year, time for a new experiment. Sometimes I see a movie that I'd like to mention to you, but I don't necessarily feel the need to do a full solo review on it. It occurred to me that I could try doing a monthly recap, where I discuss noteworthy movies that I saw the month before that I didn't discuss in a solo review. Let's give it a try. As I go through the first half of this list, it's gonna sound like all I saw were World War II movies. I assure you, that's not all I watch, but it's something my parents and I enjoy doing together on the weekends, and so I see a lot of them. First up is The Counterfeit Traitor from 1962. This is a World War II espionage thriller starring William Holden and Lily Palmer. I believe it's based on a true story. Recently blacklisted, Holden's character is hired by the Allies to pretend to be a Nazi sympathizer to infiltrate and spy on Germany. He wants nothing to do with the war, but given his situation, he's forced to accept the job. But no matter how much he tries to stay disengaged, his involvement with various characters challenges his position and his conscience. This story may be a little slow to start, but as it progresses, it gets better and better. My dad and I both agreed it was a very good movie, thoroughly entertaining, and I thought that the final act especially was quite gripping. The second movie is from 1998, so not all of these war movies are old, called When Trumpets Fade. Ron Eldard stars as a soldier who has no desire to be in the war and just wants to get out. Unfortunately, his survival and battle instincts are so strong, he ends up the only one left of his platoon, and as a result, he's promoted, when all he wants is to get discharged. This is a violent, grim, anti-war piece that focuses on the perspective of the unwilling soldier against the backdrop of the Battle of Hurtgen Forest. It's difficult and bleak, but a good movie in a depressing way, and one scene that impressed me was when one of the new replacements is put in a foxhole and admits to the medic that no one's told him what to do. I've always wondered how soldiers know how to react in any given situation. Apparently, according to this movie, they don't. The next two movies, and the last war movies on the list, I think, were especially memorable to me because of their supporting cast. One is Orders to Kill from 1958. This movie stars Paul Massey as a young bomber pilot recruited to parachute into occupied Paris to find and kill a suspected traitor in the French resistance. I don't think I recognized Paul Massey, and I wasn't initially impressed, but he did grow on me as his situation becomes more complicated. But what really pulled me in were the other actors. Eddie Albert, who gets top billing, was great. Lillian Gish, who gets third billing, is only in two short scenes, and in the first, uh, no, the second one, she hardly says anything, but her face is so expressive. The rest were actors I don't think I recognized. James Robertson Justice, Leslie French, Irene Worth. But they delivered such good performances that they really elevated the quality of the film and made it a tense, engrossing drama. The other movie was The Seventh Cross from 1944. Seven men escape from a concentration camp in Germany. They are hunted down one by one and put on display as a warning to other prisoners. Spencer Tracy stars as the last escapee, running through Germany looking for someone he can still trust. Tracy doesn't talk much for a lot of this movie, but he communicates physically, and his performance is very good. But what really hit me were the smaller appearances, some of them so brief they were more like cameos, of Agnes Moorhead, George Suzanne as Bellani the Acrobat, Stephen Garay as the Jewish Doctor, and George McCready. Is it pronounced McCready or McCready? I don't know. But whatever it is, I found his minor story arc particularly compelling, and I was about as interested in what was going to happen to him as I was in the overall plot. I'll be upfront with you. I seem to have a thing for George McCready, McCready, whatever it is. Sometimes I'm indifferent to him. But other times, I find him awfully attractive. I don't know why. It's weird because he's usually a villain, but... I don't know, it must be that voice. 
So after seeing him briefly, but most impressively, in the Seventh Cross, I was itching to see him again, and what do you know, I found My Name is Julia Ross on YouTube. I'd seen it before, but I hadn't seen the whole thing, so I took this as my opportunity. My Name is Julia Ross, from 1945, is a noirish thriller starring Nina Falk as a struggling woman who accepts a position as secretary for an older lady and her son Ralph played respectively by Dane May Whitty and George McCready. The night after she's hired, Julia Ross wakes to find herself in a new house in an unknown location, where everyone insists that her name is Marion, that she's Ralph's wife, and that she's not allowed to leave. McCready as Ralph is, of course, splendidly sinister and rather psychotic. Julia is quite resourceful, but he and his mother always seem to be one step ahead of her. This makes for a pretty tense movie, short at only 65 minutes, but with some nice chills and thrills. Speaking of chills and thrills, I also saw 1979's Alien for the second time. I do like Alien, which is probably a shock to some of you. It's not exactly my kind of movie, and I do find watching it to be an incredibly stressful experience. Some movies scare you, and then you see them a couple times, and then they don't scare you anymore. Alien is not one of those movies for me. I basically watched the entire second half from the chestburster scene onward like this, with my hands covering my eyes every time the xenomorph comes on screen. So why do I like it? I don't know. I like 1950s sci-fi horror movies, and while this goes much farther with violence and gore and language than those ever could, I appreciate that it's a well-done, creative, fascinating, focused sci-fi horror film. And the sequel, Aliens, is really good too. Possibly better. How often do you get to say that? Okay, last one. This is a movie I hadn't seen before, and it's not a war movie, but it is old. It's So Long at the Fair from 1950. A girl and her older brother, played by Gene Simmons and David Tomlinson, stop for a couple days in Paris during the World Fair of 1889. The morning after a night out, she wakes to find that not only has her brother and his room completely disappeared, but the hotel owners claim he was never there. Gene Simmons is very effective as the desperate, tortured soul whom nobody believes, and Dirk Bogard co-stars as the friendly young man, more like knight in shining armor, who comes to her assistance. She looks amazingly vulnerable in her elegant costuming, and he looks pretty good too, and I like the relationship between them, and all this with the suspenseful mystery and an unexpected twist makes for a very entertaining movie. So those were my January highlights. All of the titles I mentioned will be listed below. I hope there was something to catch your interest. I'd like to hear your thoughts and reactions to any of the movies I mentioned, and let me know what you think of this new idea. I look forward to hearing from you. Thanks for watching! Bye!